Hey everyone, before we get started, just a reminder that if you like this podcast, be sure to rate it on iTunes or in whatever platform you're listening. Leave a comment and share it with your friends. And if you haven't heard our last two episodes, go back and check them out. We had Frank Jones from FreedomElectricMarine.com talk about developing a hands-free fishing boat that you can take in six inches of water. And then we had Jeff and Nicholas Smith from MuscleClubApparel.com share their story about developing a passionate following and brand out of sheer necessity of needing extra income. Both are incredible stories. Um, If you want to share your story about how you developed your business, we'd love to hear from you. Give us a call or contact us through TriangleDirectMedia.com. Now, today's story starts all the way back in 1976 with an immigration from Lebanon to New York City. So here we go. Hello, and welcome to My Digital Story. I'm Jason Gillikin with Triangle Direct Media. At TDM, we do online marketing for all different types of companies, and we hear some amazing stories. On this podcast, we get to share some of those. It's for those of you who want to be inspired by the everyday entrepreneur, the hustlers, the grinders, the one-day millionaires maybe, but more importantly, the people who want to be their own boss. Today, we have Zavan Ganimian, the CEO of Simon G Jewelers. And this story is really about two people, Zavin, who goes by Z, and his dad, Simon, who started the company 37 years ago. For those of you who haven't heard of Simon G, they're a pretty well-known brand of diamonds and jewelry. And if you've ever shopped for an engagement ring, it's likely that you've seen some of their pieces because they're in over 900 locations throughout the United States. They have over 500,000 fans on Facebook and over 130,000 on Instagram. But their story starts from just about the most humble of beginnings that you can possibly imagine. Simon, my father, was an immigrant uh, to the United States in the early 70s, and he migrated here from Lebanon. When he landed in the United States, he had about $200 to his name, and he wanted to become an engineer. So he went to college to sign up for engineering school, and unfortunately, his $200 didn't get him very far. He went to a local family member that was in uh, New York at the time and looked for a part-time job so he can pay for his schooling. The part-time job that was available was a diamond setter. He had some background on jewelry because of uncles in the business back in Lebanon, but he started in New York setting diamonds. You just think about that. What if you had told Simon back when he came to America that one day he would pass a thriving business with thousands of pieces in hundreds of locations to his son? when he only had $200 in his pocket. But he had that passion and drive, and in this story you'll hear about how he passed that along to his son as well. And now that Z has taken over the business, how does he take it to the next level? One of the most interesting challenges they face today is, do they take the business to that next level by starting to sell directly to the consumer? Because right now they don't. Maybe they would make more money, but maybe it would compromise relationships with retailers that they've developed over the past 35 plus years. Anyway, take a listen, it's a great story here. My name is Zavin Ganimian, also call me Z, and I'm the CEO of Simon G Jewelry and Zagani Jewelry. Well, great. Thanks for coming on the podcast here. So Simon G, the company, uh, officially started in Los Angeles in the early 80s, but now did your did your dad start it? Is that right? That yeah, is. Uh, as a matter of fact, Simon G, Simon, my father, was an immigrant uh, to the United States in the early 70s, and he migrated here from Lebanon. Uh, He escaped from all that was going on there. And he came with ambitions to be an engineer. He came, uh, he didn't come from a very wealthy background. When he landed in the United States, he had about $200 to his name, and he wanted to become an engineer. So he went to college to sign up for engineering school, and unfortunately, his $200 didn't get him very far. We didn't stop him at all, actually. And he he went to a local family member that was in uh, New York at the time and looked for a part-time job so he can pay for his schooling. Oh, wow. And one of the part-time, the part-time job that was available was a diamond setter uh, making jewelry. He had some background on jewelry because of uh, our uncles in the business back in Lebanon. Mm-hmm. Um, but he started in New York setting diamonds. His passion grew, you know, he got more and more involved in the business and actually never ended up 
finishing up or going to engineering school, but actually pursuing his career in jewelry. He came to uh, Los Angeles in 78 on vacation, saw that there was a big industry here and the weather was a little better. <laughs> I don't think he ever went back after that, or he might have gone back, packed up and just came back to Los Angeles. Wow. Okay. So he just came in, came here from Lebanon and then uh, he's got $200 in his pocket in New York City and then um, it doesn't work out with college. And so what, what, you said he went to an, an uncle and so he started working for him? Yes. He had a family member there that was in the jewelry business. Oh my 47. God. So he started, he started working there as a diamond center. Okay. And so then in Los, he goes to Los Angeles in the, in the late seventies and then starts up yeah, Simon did. G jewelry at, at that point. No, he actually comes to Los Angeles. sees that there's an industry here. He had been saving up for a few years, uh, goes back, packs up his thing, comes to Los Angeles, opens a small little 250 square foot area on Hill street. Oh, wow. And so he was getting work from different companies, like a subcontractor, and doing a lot of cutting. Mm -hmm. In 1980, when it became, you know, when he started really ramping up and uh, getting a lot of work, he figured, you know, it's time to establish my own company and, and start to legitimately work very professionally. So in 1980, he went to the city hall, um, to the business bureau, and wanted to register his name Simon Ganinian Henry. Uh, the clerk at the counter looked at him and said, you know, the last name's a little tough, <laughs> so it might be better if we abbreviate it to just G, to so calling it Simon G. And he said fine, and that's uh -huh. how Simon G was born. Oh, wow. Uh, that, yeah. that worked out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And so today we have her to thank. We don't know her name. That's how we got Simon G, and it was established in 1980 in Los Angeles. Okay, wow. So in the in the 80s, then you know, was the company growing fast? Um, was was your dad going door to door and trying to sell? Like, you know, was was the store still active? How did that work in, in throughout the 80s? So most of the work that was done was subcontracted. So it'd be other manufacturers that had. Uh, an abundance of work that needed that couldn't keep up with production and they would subcontract the work out. Uh, mm -hmm. My dad was a sub a contractor for those companies and it was growing, but it wasn't growing like a brand and it wasn't a brand at the time. It wasn't until the late eighties where he started, he started to create his own jewelry line or collection. Okay. And that's when he started knocking door to door. In 1994 was the first trade show, and that's when the brand really started to begin. Between 94 and 99, it was door-to-door -door pounding every single retail store in the United States. He was prospecting. He'd get in the car and go to the stores and literally walk in and say, hey, this is what I do. This is my collection. Would you be interested in carrying my line? Wow. And so is this... Just around Los Angeles? Is this throughout the United States? Like, where, where is he going? Throughout the United States, all every almost every single state. It started obviously in California and grew from there. We still some have some of our original first first customers that have supported us from day one. It was going through the different cities and also doing regional trade shows. The regional trade shows led to different prospects and clientele. It also opened up a new door for salespeople, a sales force that could remotely work and represent the line. Oh, okay. Uh, that 200 square foot shop became 500, 500 became 1500, 1500 became 2000. It was like a 500 square foot office and then the office next door would open up and then an office on the other side would open up as the years went by. And that's how we grew our, look, our space. Wow. Okay. And so when you're growing up, I mean, what's your perspective of this? Like you see your dad just grinding then uh, on these trade shows and, you know, going door to door um, and just just hustling. And so that had to that had to influence you as a kid. Um, it did. I, I played baseball as a kid and, you know, I'd always be kind of, you know, my dad wasn't able to make it to a lot of the games or, you know, my dad wasn't going to drop me off at school or pick me up. 
And it, I guess it was a little tough in the beginning to understand that, especially at that age. Mm-hmm. I would say not until today I understand the value or, or I, I understand why that happened. And uh, the outcome is, is clear. You know, he really was dedicated to business and he was working all the time, all the time. Funny enough, at home, he had a jewelry bench in his bedroom. And he was, uh, you know, on weekends, we knew that Sundays was our day to the day with dad. Sunday, he would work till about 10 a.m., 11 a.m. on the bench. And then about 11 a.m., we'd take a, uh, we'd take a family trip. And that was to a local park. Usually, you know, he had uh, some friends that we'd always, uh, on Sundays, we'd go out as a family. Gotcha. Okay. And so because your dad, um, you know, was, was working so hard, did that kind of push you away from wanting to be in the jewelry business initially? Or did you kind of know, yeah, this is what I'm going to do when I, you know, when I become an adult? So my passion was cars. Uh-huh. Really, I mean, I was in love with them. I couldn't wait. Uh, you know, I built my first go-kart. It didn't run very well. It didn't stop very well. But, you know, my dad was not that guy at all uh, in terms of cars and bicycles and outdoors so what i actually did was i didn't really you know think about going into the business um on saturdays every single saturday we'd go in um i'd have a great time you know go there do the kind of you know sweep this up pick that up take this here bring this back and just kind of do the the really kind of small stuff Mm -hmm. every single saturday my clockwork and then i got into um as i got a little bit older my passion for cars, I got into the body shop business. I worked for a body shop restoring classic cars, and that lasted for about three years. Uh, the reason that kind of stopped was the pay was really bad and it was really dirty work. <laughs> you know, I'd come home, <laughs> I'd come home a mess. It was a lot of fun because I got to drive all these cool cars and I got to work on them, and it was a great learning experience. But unfortunately, the pay wasn't there. I couldn't, there's, the way I was going, there's no way I'm going to get one of these cars one day. I mean, I'd have to work like a hundred years. So a friend of mine was working at a paintball field and paintball was very popular at the time. Yeah. And he said, listen, they're paying top dollar at this paintball field. Why don't you come work there? And I thought, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try it out. I went and I, th- I applied for, for a job at the paintball field as a, as a referee. Uh, I took the referee job. My first day on the job, I got hit with a paintball. Oh, no. And man, it hurt. <laughs> it hurt really bad. It hit me on my pinky and my pinky blistered. Uh, you know, I won't forget it. It really, really hurt. So I thought, you know what? Uh, you know, I don't know if I want to do this referee thing. I talked to the boss and I said, hey, you know what? Can I work in the gun department where they, where you guys fill up the tank, repair the guns, uh, you know, rent them out? And there was an opening. There was a guy who had called in sick. And uh, that day I went in and I never came out of there. And I worked there for about four or five years. I really enjoyed it. Went through college there. And then another opportunity came where uh, another friend of ours was working at the American Red Cross as a as a recruiter. I said, you know, I, I, I'm not that big of a people person, but, you know, the pay sounds good and it was incentivized. So I said, sure. And sure enough, I did it and I loved it. And I started to work with people on the phone, get, get those skills in and learn how to communicate. And at that point, I think Simon, he was starting to see that maturity. And he said, you know, would you want to start coming in a little bit more? And so I worked at the Red Cross for a few days a week and I'd go and see downtown a few days a week. And it was a lot of grunt work, a lot. And I said, you know, it was, it was a little tough, but I did it. It worked out. And then he kind of gave me the opportunity to go to CAD, CAD programming school. I don't know. That meant a lot to me that I thought that, oh my God, he really does. You know, give, he's given me the opportunity to help him design and turn his ideas into CAD. I thought, all right, all right. And that's kind of where it started. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's so interesting. You know, go back to the cars and, the, and restoring the classic cars how your dad is working with his hands on the jewelry and then you decide to work with your hands on the cars. And that's both your, both of your passions there. 
until today, you know, I, I'm still a big car, big car advocate, and I'm always tinkering with something in the garage. Oh, very cool. When you came on board then, and when you said he sent you to, to, to CAD school, is that right? Yes. His thing was really simple. He says it to, so today. He's like, he said to me, I'm going to give you what my dad gave me, and that's zero. He said, you have to earn it. You have to earn it. And it's not like you're just going to walk in and, hey, you're the boss, you're the boss's son. You need to earn yourself and earn that respect. So after CAD school, I went to gemology. I studied to be a gemologist there. After studying, he arranged for an opportunity for me to work and study further in Israel. So he moved me to Israel for about a year, and I studied diamonds there. And I got a job of sorting diamonds and learned a lot about the trade of diamonds. Yeah. The jewelry business, I, I like to say that it's, it's really divided up into a few different segments. The diamond segment is completely different from the jewelry section. There's diamond, you know, the miners, manufacturers, the polishers, the sorters. That's a whole kind of entity on its own. And then there's the manufacturing where it's just getting the diamonds and uh, creating jewelry with them. And so you know, from, from learning about all that, what knowledge have you used you know, now that you're the CEO of, uh, of Simon G? A good question. What I've learned from those experiences, I also had, had to live in India for about a year learning how to assort the stones. Is huh. Today, as a company, uh, we consume or we, we purchase thousands of carats of diamonds. And as we purchase those thousands of carats, today, there's a lot of things going on with uh, CVD or, or man-made diamonds, being able to identify those, using the bring it in the proper equipment, the proper processes. And not letting anybody be able to pull a fast one. You know, when, when you're buying stones all over the world, you're buying them thousand carats at a time. You can't, if he makes, if, if someone were to mix five or six carats of fake diamonds in there, how would you ever know? Yeah. So being able to good find good sources, putting in processes to ensure that nothing like that happens. Yeah. Okay. And so what year was that where you're going to Israel and then you're going to India? <laughs> Uh, mid mid to early 2000, maybe okay. 2003, 4, 5. Gotcha. All or right. maybe 2000, a little bit later on, yeah. At, at that point, um, it looked like, and I was just looking at LinkedIn, but it looks like you were the, the marketing director. Yeah. We started to advertise in 2000, 2001. And here I am that has a lot of experience in diamond jewelry making, and I get into marketing is a little difficult at the beginning. But our thing was to, brand the product and give a promise you know we our promise on every single one of our pieces we have a signature of our name and we want to honor that brand promise sticking behind uh you know the quality the delivery time promising people the date and making the date or sooner and learn that we can be a part of people's lives in a very indirect way sure and so with marketing then i i imagine a lot of what you do you're just not sure how effective it is because you're in these stores and um, maybe somebody will see an ad, but they're not necessarily going to tell the person that they saw the ad. And that's why they're buying a, a Simon G piece. Am I, am I right on that? You are spot on. I mean, you really, that's one of our source spots is that we won't, we advertise for years. And this is something that Simon actually pushed for and realized. And what was nice about that is that he believed that the advertising would work. We would spend we would spend a lot of dollars on putting these ads, not knowing if they're actually working, because we don't have uh, any way of directly seeing how it works. Because, like you said, we don't know if this consumer walked in because that had seen our brand or that had not seen our brand. We don't know if they. They knew the brand or they did not. But so as a marketing director, how do you know that you're being successful? Like, how do you know the, the Brides magazine is working? Like, how do you know that any sort of, you know, now social media campaign is working? So how do you know, like, and as a marketing director, how do you know that you're doing your job well? So as a direct, director of marketing, what, what, how we would measure it is in the simplest form you can. And we see the bump in sales on that particular product we advertise. 
Yeah. That's what it was gauged on. So we'd see, okay, so we'd advertise a, a certain style. All of a sudden, we look and we see that, wow, it's trending very high. And so we learned and adapted to see the trend in marketing. And by 2006, 2007, we knew that whatever we advertised, we would sell. And we could see that working. Gotcha. Yeah. And so what, what forms of marketing have worked out well for you? Um, like, are you still doing the, the wedding type of magazines? Um, and what other, what other forms of advertising are working well? So obviously the number one form of advertising you hear about is social media. But I think that every year uh, that changes. You know, we've had years where magazine ads were the number one best form of advertising because they drive the most traffic to our website and our retailers. And there was a year where Facebook was the number one. And then the next year it was Instagram that was number one. Now we see a combination of them all and we have you have to be involved in all of them. So not only is it just social media, but taking it a step further and being involved with different kinds of influencers and people who uh, have a big following, partnering up with them, has gotcha. really evolved over the years. Yeah. And you mentioned those influencers. So are you trying to get pieces on celebrities then and in, in getting the influence that way? We We did a lot of celebrity work and we still work with a lot of celebrities to where Jewelry, but so as the industry as the as time passed and these industries evolved, the celebrity world kind of fell through. Today, you know, a lot of people that are indirectly shopping or looking, if, if a celebrity is wearing it, yeah, you might be interested, but sometimes it comes to be a little unattainable, especially to millennials. That they're looking for something more organic, something more real, and a celebrity isn't real. I mean. They live in an unbelievable life and they have this lifestyle that a lot of people can't have. Whereas an influencer is one of us or, 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 or someone that I can relate to because they live a normal life and they're not living in this extravagant. But, you know, they, they post all of that and they make it available to the public through videos and pictures. And so I feel like that's more after the name, obviously, influencing than, than a celebrity is today. But five years ago, the celebrity was it, and we were on all the celebrities. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah. so, uh, so when did you become the CEO of Simon G? So right around 2013, 2014, Simon felt that I was ready to take over the company and and uh, beat it. So he did name me the CEO of the company, and it was uh, different. To, transition that I didn't obviously experienced before. I always feel like it's a little bit harder coming in as a son of a business, uh, you know, uh, the son of a business owner coming into and becoming a CEO. You know, a lot of people, a lot of our employees who've been with us for 15 years, 20 years, they've seen me grow up there. Mm -hmm. And I had personal conflict with that and thinking, you know, this is someone I've grown up with. Now all of a sudden, quote unquote, I'm the boss, and uh, I had some difficulty with that, and it took me a little bit to get over that. So, did was it just you that had difficulty with it, or or did some of the employees just not welcome you as much as you would like? I can't say they wouldn't welcome me because they did absolutely, and they respected me. But maybe some of the things I said weren't taken so seriously because. You know, hey, we've been doing something like this, and it's been working great so many years. You come in now, and you're saying we should do it like that. You know, we don't think that should be done that way. Gotcha. Okay. And so what were some of the changes that you made then when you started taking over? I think a lot of internal procedures and processing. You know, the, our business as a startup continued to grow as a startup. Certain tasks are done without thought. And... They're not very transparent. Documenting those tasks, figuring out which levers to pull, what areas to advertise in further, what kind of styling should the company be uh, moving forward in terms of fashion and bridal and keeping that up to par. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And I imagine it had to be emotional for you and, and the entire company too, where you know, you saw this growing as you're growing up, and then all of a sudden that you, you, you take over. And so it had to be strange. It had to be emotional. It had to be a, a lot of things over the past you know, three, four years here. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the thing that, that really helped 
me was surrounding myself with people that have been through this before. Knowing or speaking with someone who's experienced this, maybe not in my industry, but a different industry, really helped guide me through a lot of these challenges and these emotional problems that you have, you know, thinking, that, wait, is this because of me? What's going on? Why isn't this working? So is your dad still involved in the business then? He's uh, very involved. Uh, Simon says he's probably going to work till his very last day. He <laughs> loves the business. He's very passionate about it. So I don't think he'll ever, ever stop. Honestly, it's been fantastic for us. It's like an encyclopedia. It's like an instant Google you can go to with a question. You know, hey, Dad, we're having problems with this. What can we do? Oh, he goes, oh, you know, and he gives you a, the answer you want to hear or you need to hear to go do it. Sometimes you don't like it, but uh, it's really, really nice to have that there. So then how is how is his role transition? Like, has he moved away from management and now is more designing jewelry? Like, what is he doing? Exactly. He's moved away from a lot of the admin and business side of it and really gone into finding, hunting down the most collectible or the most rarest gemstones or finding the best parcel of diamonds to purchase or designing the new collection and going through it. Uh, so he's really focusing on that part as opposed to the everyday uh, running the business, uh, you know, all the admin. Oh, that is cool. I mean, that, that has to be such a relief um, and such satisfaction there where he can kind of get back to his roots and start to, you know, start to design more so than more so than run a business. That's exactly. And that's kind of and he's been, you know, honestly, as as he is released from a lot of the stress, he goes on a lot of trips. He travels a lot with my mom. And as they travel around the world, he gets inspired, he sees things, he puts ideas together, finds new sources, and comes back and says, hey, look, this is what I found. Let's put this together. Let's put, just like it was, just like the business that started yesterday. And so with you as a CEO, um, you've got a vision for the future, I imagine. Like, where do you see Simon G in, in five years? And where do you see Simon G in, in 10 years? That's the question we ask ourselves every single day. Um, and it's something that I ask everybody in, the, in our company to think about. Where are we going to be in five years? And today we see that, you know, definitely in continuing the representation of our company throughout the country uh, and in Europe. I'd like to grow more in Asia in five years, as well as parts of South America. One of the biggest questions that, you know, we face and we ask it at all times, will it, will it be directly to public? Will we sell directly to public? Yep. And that's a, that's a question that I think in our realm, all of us are challenged with, but it's very difficult to do something like that when you've had so many great retail partners support you for so many years, so many years. So going directly to public, I will leave it at, if our retailers approve and it works out, then we probably will. But if not, I mean, right now we stand strong, we stand behind them. And as long as our partnership with our retailers works out great and we're uh, thriving, there's no reason for us to go to the public. And that's such a tough decision. Um, you know, you've got... Uh, very, you, very. Your website said you have 900 retailers? Yes. Yeah, so 900 retailers. And you're thinking, and, and, and just so everybody knows, um, you don't sell anything on your website right now. It, it's just... Um, right. showing exactly what all the pieces are and, and you give bleeds out to your retailers. Um, but you would make more profit if it was B2C, um, if you were selling directly to the consumer. But then again, you know, where, what about the relationship with, um, with the retailers? And so that's, that's definitely yeah. a challenge. Like what have your, like have your competitors embraced the direct to public model? Um, or are, are most like you where they're like, oh, I don't, I don't want to upset the, the, the retailers. So some of them haven't cared about the retailers sold directly to public, uh, and they fail because, you know, you do need a little bit of service. If the ring size isn't correct, if, you know, something happens as a consumer, you want the confidence of being able to walk in somewhere and trust someone. Instead of putting your fifteen thousand, ten thousand dollar diamond in a box and shipping it off to someone you've never even seen before, 
So you do need the retailers, and a lot of our, some of our um, competitors have failed at that, and some of them have succeeded. And a lot of creative ways are coming up. It feels like the future, you can see that, quote unquote, the middleman is going to be gone. In a lot of other industries, that's happened. It's very evident. But our industry, we're still, I think, behind the trend because we're so traditional and we don't have a lot of new people coming into the business, right? We don't have a lot of millennials that are interested in setting diamonds or, or selling jewelry in a, in, in a jewelry store. They could have a lot more monetary success elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And that's been a really difficult aspect for a lot of these store owners. Yeah. And it's got to be old school to a degree, too, because a lot of people just simply aren't going to buy something that's thousands of dollars directly from a website without ever truly seeing it. You know, I, I would be one of those people yeah. that, that wouldn't buy directly from a website, but but others are, are different than me. Yeah. And, and one of the ways many companies have battled that is to give you guaranteed 30 day returns. So, hey. Mm. You know, we'll send it out to you, look at it, touch it, feel it, try it on in the comfort of your own home. You don't have to have any pressure. If you like it, you can keep it. If you don't, just you can send it back. They try to buy your confidence with that. And unlike a pair of jeans or a pair of shoes or something like that, diamonds don't wear out. You know, it's really kind of neat. There's no depreciation on it if you were to just send it back in 30 days. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so talk about Zagani. Um, I was looking at that website as well, and it looks like you started it with your brother in 2008. Is that right? That's right. Um, 2008, you know, obviously with the economy and everything coming to a complete halt, my brother and I saw that a little bit of a void in the market. We saw that there was an opportunity. There was people coming to us and saying, hey, Z, we want to get married. You know, with 2,500 bucks, what do you suggest I do? And I said, you know, with $2,500, it'd be very difficult to buy a one a diamond ring that's decent. So what could we do and what, how could we adapt to that market? So my brother and I decided that we were going to use the resources we had with LMG and develop a line that was in that price range of 400 to $1,200. Fifteen hundred dollars retail, okay, and fill in that gap. And we wanted to offer what that we didn't see. Most of the things in that price point were the, you know, the mall jewelry. Get five carats for one hundred ninety nine dollars, but it's really like a frozen ball of spit because <laughs> you can't even see it. But, you know, it's a trend. It's not a transparent stone. And we thought this is really garbage. And, you know, for that with our sourcing, we might be able to do this. And so we went. We actually went back, looked at our sourcing for diamonds, found that, you know, if if it's not an SI diamond and a VS diamond were close, nothing would be visible to the naked eye in those smaller sizes. And we'll do it in a 14 carat instead of an 18 carat to help them down the price point. And so we came up with it, and it was kind of a rebellious move because Simon G traditionally has been very, very kind of conservative in their designs. And we thought with Zagani, we're going to be super edgy and just go completely against the grain. You know, some of our internal, you know, the manufacturing team doesn't like that too much. Didn't like it at the time because, you know, this is the way we do it and this is the way it's done. But we challenged all of that. And we really turned it on its head, created a lot of chaos, but we got it off the ground. And thank God today is doing very well. Yeah. Yeah. I think you've got like 500,000 Facebook followers or something like that. <laughs> and so you've got, yeah. you've got quite the following. So what did your dad think when you started this? I think he almost gave that to us as a um, project, right? If you can make this succeed, I'll trust you a lot more with the company, Simon G. Huh. If you can make it happen, let's see. I think it was almost a test. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, and so now, how do you allocate your time, like between Simon G and, and Zagani, or is it all is it all kind of one and the same? That's a very good question. It's one of the things I'm challenged with very, very much. One thing that I'm very grateful for is that I work with family, a lot of my family members, including my wife and my brother. I'm able to trust them both blindly, knowing that they have the best interest for the company, along with all the members, of course. But they help me a great deal. 
and I'm able to lean on them. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you guys are are continuing to grow um, with Zagani and and with Simon G. Um, and with you coming on board as CEO, and you, know, you have the opportunity to to go very far with this and take Simon G to that next level. I sure, I you know, I, I, I that's my dream, and I and I look forward to doing that. And uh, it's very hard. Sometimes you do get distracted. You look around and sometimes you think sometimes it's a lot easier to just build something from scratch than to try to, uh, you know, take something else and modify it, modify it. But I have to be very, very thankful. Years of dedicated hard work that Simon invested in, in it. And I, I can't, I can't lose sight of that. I feel like a lot of people that take over a business or take over a family business, they do. They don't realize the hard work that's been put into it for many years and the dedication. Well, and for you, you've done both now, where you've you're working on a company that's well established, but then also started from something from scratch with with Zagani. Um, so that's really cool. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Z, I, I appreciate your time today, and uh, thanks for coming on. This is a, this is an awesome story. Um, this has been so great to hear about it. So that was Zeke Anemian, who's in charge of the family business and his father's legacy. Before we go, I'll leave you with a little clip from the Simon G website. It's Simon and Z talking about that legacy. But until next time, I'm Jason Gilligan with Triangle Direct Media, and you've been listening to My Digital Story. Legacy means that whatever you learn, whatever dream or whatever you have, you have to pass it to your second generation and they have to continue your legacy. No one knows what's in the future, but we know one thing, is that we never want to stop. This is something that's a passion for all of us. This is something that we want to live on forever. It's a tradition. It's an art. It's a form of expression that we want to preserve for as long as we can.